We are Campaign Force. This is the Veterans in Politics podcast. Let's introduce you to our guest. This episode features the Shadow Veterans Minister, Sharon Hodgson, MP. We open up the conversation with Sharon revealing the names of those from her intake into Parliament and the importance of the network to her several years on. Though not a veteran herself, Sharon can very much be described as a veteran of politics, having served both in and out of government, including in defence briefs. During this episode, witness podcast and political history as Sharon pauses to electronically vote, explaining the process to you, the listener. Sharon finishes up explaining some of the challenges women face in politics and how she overcomes online trolls that seem to plague social media. It's time for you to listen to the conversation. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Hodgson, the MP for Washington and Sunderland West up here in the northeast. Um, and this is a local accent. So um, you are here hearing me right. This is how we talk up here. I don't know if anybody here is from my neck of the woods. Um, uh, I'm not from Sunderland, although my seat that I represent is Sunderland. I'm actually from Gateshead. My first seat was Gates at Eastern Washington West. So I literally was um, the MP for my hometown. Um, so I've been an MP since 2005. So that's 15 years. Um, just had the anniversary of that last week. Um, I was elected on the 5th of May 2005. And there's a group of us in Parliament um, called the 555ers. Um, and that group used to contain people like Ed Balls, um, who joined our Zoom call. We had an anniversary Zoom call last week, and Sadiq Khan was a 555er, for Labour, obviously, from wow. um, my party. And then Ed Miliband, but he didn't join the call last week. Um, so there's still sort of a, a, a good core of us who are still in Parliament, and then others like uh, Sadiq and Ed, who escaped to go mm. off and do either international television celebrity strictly type programs and Sadiq who's running London so um so yes so that's one of the things that we can talk about how the camaraderie with um your intake you know when you um become an MP is probably very similar to the intake of when you joined your particular forces I imagine um you, you know similar groupings exist and you stay in touch in that way um i'm currently the shadow minister for veterans as johnny said um appointed to this role by Kia starmer i've never served or been a reservist or anything like that so this is all really really new to me although i did have the privilege of being pps to bob ainsworth and um, when he was armed forces minister when we were in government around 2007 8 and Des Brown was the Secretary of State at that time. Um, so I was in the MOD team um, for a year, which was very exciting, um, going into the MOD for, for meetings and, and such like at that level. Um, but then when Bob moved on to become Secretary of State, I actually then swapped over to be PPS to Dawn Primarolo in the Department of Health when she was doing public health. And that was during the sort of Tammy, the um, bird flu crisis. I remember Tammy flu was the sort of keen, the thing that was talked about as much as sort of PPE is talked about now. Um, so that is, I've held another, uh, uh, I was PPS also in the Home Office when we were in government to Liam Byrne. Um, PPS, as you know, is Parliamentary Private Secretaries. So they were sort of three PPS appointments in government. Then in my last year in government, Gordon Brown appointed me to be a government whip. So I served as a government whip um, from 2009 till 10. Then we went into opposition and then I was an opposition whip for the first year in opposition. Then when Ed Miliband, I was um, chair of, I'm big friends with Ed Balls and I was chair of his campaign, co-chair with Vernon Corker, who was an MP. But when he ran to be leader, obviously, um, that was unsuccessful, sadly, in my point of view. Um, Ed Miliband won, and Ed Miliband asked me to be Shadow Children and Families Minister, which I was very happy um, to do. And I did that for the best part of four years, I think. Then um, I was reshuffled to be the Women in Equalities Brief, which I did for a year. Then we lost another election and then Jeremy Corbyn became the leader and then Jeremy asked me to do shadow public health 
no, I think I did shadow children and families for a bit longer. And then, um, then I was asked to do public health after he was re-elected as leader. So I did the public health brief for a good four and a half years. And um, Kia has uh, now become leader and asked me to do the shadow veterans brief. Wow. So um, it's been a very exciting career with a little bit of experience in government, which I can tell you for a start is much better than being in opposition. That's <laughs> obvious, I suppose. I'm sure it is. I mean, that is such a, wow, what an amazing career that you've had and uh, something that can, for all of us, can look at and really be inspired by that a variation over the years. And it's great to hear about that cohort, that community of those oh. uh, those originals that you talk about. But um, so what's it like being Shadow Veterans Minister so far? Uh, initial thoughts and feelings about the role? I was sort of really excited and also overwhelmed at first, realising that um, how much you don't know. I had that when I became Shadow Public Health Minister as well, and that's such a huge brief. But then, you know, over time, um, you you get to know the brief really well. And um, I'm well supported by Jess, my uh, brilliant researcher who's on this call. Je oh, there she is. Um, Jess is on the call. Um, and so Jess as well, uh, you know, obviously for your team, because um, in opposition, you only have, you don't get, whereas the government minister will have the whole of the department obviously supporting them and they get like the, the ministerial team. Um, I just have my parliamentary staff and an MP has about enough budget for five staff and I have two in the constituency and three in parliament and some people um some MPs may have their staff uh, they may only have one person in parliament and then three or four in the constituency um and I have it because I'm so busy in parliament with being a shadow minister and also a chair um which is quite unusual about five all party groups on various um different subjects that I have kept going and people think I'm a bit mad and you know my staff sometimes think I'm a bit mad and I've kept mm -hmm. those going because they aren't the gift of um, the leader of your party yeah. whereas whether I'm a, sh a shadow minister or not is now up to here um, whether I'm chair of the all party group on school food or the all party group on ovarian cancer is up to parliamentarians who are interested in, it's an all party group who are interested in that area. And then, you know, we'll appoint, we'll, you know, at an AGM, we have an AGM and they'll agree that I'm um, the chair and I'm vice chair and co-chair of, of, and then just a member of other all party groups. So there's hundreds and hundreds. You must know, if you don't know about this, all party groups I can explain about that so I've kept those on so it means I'm very very busy in parliament so I have my staff three in parliament and two up here and um, the ones up here take care and responsible for the majority of the constituency casework and then in parliament Jess supports me on my front bench position and is the most senior of the three staff in parliament and uh, the others help deal with policy responses and all party group stuff which Jess does also um, so she does a lot of work and so she was as anxious as I was you know because she didn't know what brief I was going to get so then when I got this brief we both sort of thought right you know and then it's during lockdown as well yeah. which is because normally um, what would happen we would just fill my diary with stakeholder meetings so the first thing you do is you meet all the key people, you know, you just, and that's it. Well, that's how I do it when I've changed briefs. I just meet everyone and you just become a sponge because, you know, the thing about being an MP and a parliamentarian and then a, a minister, a shadow minister, is very rarely does someone get appointed to the brief in which they might have some historical expertise. Mm -hmm. I can remember in government, I was, uh, John Reid was Home Secretary when I was PPS to Liam Byrne as the immigration minister, John Reid had nine briefs in nine years. He was he was sort of Tony Blair just moved him like a, a troubleshooter every year, and he literally had he was Secretary of State in nine departments over nine years. Very well um, thought of as well. <laughs> so he obviously wasn't an expert maybe in any of those. I think mm. he he did a year at Defence. I'm sure from memory. Um, so. What you are is the, the like sort of the political, you're supposed to give the political leadership to that department to deliver the 
party's manifesto that if you've been elected into government to deliver your party's manifesto within that department and obviously you then look to experts and um, that's where the special advisors come in and um, the department obviously is already full of experts and you are there to, to ensure that whatever you've promised in your manifesto then gets delivered in government. In opposition, our job obviously is to scrutinise that because we, we cannot deliver anything because we're in opposition, we're not elected, we haven't been given that permission by the, the country. So our job is to scrutinise, be part of the scrutiny within Parliament um, and on behalf of the people and our constituents um, to scrutinise what the government is trying to do. So. Um, yeah, what an Part insight! Of, what an insight uh, into ministerial life, uh, Shadow, yeah. and that. Um, and uh, obviously, Jess has been fantastic, by the way, in setting this up. Uh, so, thank you very much. And uh, it's a huge honour to be part of that initial sponge. Um, that you talk of uh, in, as you come into brief. So, it's been, that's been brilliant. Um, and uh, quite uniquely, at the moment, um, you've got these electronic uh, voting. Um, do you want to tell us about yeah. how that's how that's working out? Yes, thanks, Rob. Because I'll have to make sure I keep my phone. Um, we uh, we've trialed for the last couple of weeks. It's just saying that it's having trouble connecting. So we've trialed for the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, you be aware the virtual parliament is yeah. um, is quite successful. Even though we're all mourning about how we can't get <laughs> as many opportunities to be called, and the only where the defence questions would have normally been an hour, there were only 30 minutes, there's a lot less opportunities yeah. and then debates are sort of truncated and statements, important statements like the one the PM did yesterday would normally be, I mean, Theresa May and Cameron would do three hour statements and every single MP who wanted to ask a question mm. would be able to ask a question where I think Boris did about an hour 10 minutes, one hour 10 minutes yesterday, so it's much truncated. But it's working under lockdown, so that's good. The I'm other thing sure they said we'd well. never. <laughs> the other thing they said we'd never be able to do is um, have electronic voting. Everyone's wanted it for some time, and Parliament's always said that it'll never happen, and we've got to vote in person through the lobbies. Um, which, when I'm sure you've seen some photographs, sometimes if we're all, if all 650 MPs are almost all in one lobby, which sometimes weirdly happens if the SNP or one of the Irish parties have called a vote and we're all, you know, there, there can be sort of 601 lobby and maybe just the SNP in the other lobby. Um, it can be a bit um, uncomfortable to say the least. So, and then also when we had all those indicative votes over Brexit, we were doing yeah. sort of 15 votes, which just took hours and hours and hours and hours um, of, you know, shuffling through the, the lobby and not able, you know, luckily you can work on your phone. But they've always said we couldn't do it any other way. Obviously now with the virtual parliament, they've had to find another way. Um, but they, they've insisted that this is only going to be for this special circumstance. So we've got something on um, our laptops, computers and my phone, Members Hub. I don't oh. know if you can see it. Ooh. So this is, I've had to log into that using my parliamentary um, login details and everything. And then you'll see there's a little thing that's flashing live, saying monitoring for new divisions. Okay. Sort of on the green bars. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So um, that's where sometime around 5.30, my phone, it'll, it'll tell me there's a division and I'll, I'll, I'll let you see at each step. And this is also now where I can... Um, I can submit, apply for questions because that's not focusing. Um, if I wanted, if there's a statement, well, there's no, Parliament only sits Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday at the moment. So if this was, say, Tuesday, they'd be under action required. It's not focusing at all. No, we get, I think we, we get the, uh, yeah. the gist. That's a... Uh... I'd That's be able amazing. to apply to ask a question tomorrow, which is normally you would have to do it um, either in person at the table office or um, via a PC. But they've, they've done all this sort of new technology. They've tested it quite extensively for the last um, couple of weeks. We've been having sort of divisions, you know, morning, 11 o'clock mm. and then at four o'clock. But uh, the first real one was yesterday and it worked. I don't know how many actually voted because... 
seemingly a little insight, the Speaker, I mean, it's not a secret because the Speaker announced it in the House yesterday, there was still, even after all the tests, eight MPs who hadn't participated. Mm. And he was saying, you know, if those eight MPs are having problems, please get in touch and let us know, because they didn't want them sort of, you know, screaming um, afterwards mm. that they'd been disenfranchised or whatever. But um, I think that's quite good for 650 people who are varying degrees of IT literate, where all bar eight to have managed to work out how to That's vote. pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's going to be about five votes. So I'll, if I get distracted, right. it'll be it's very quick because I've I've done it before. So no problem. I've already told Je- Jess that she's on standby to be um you know, <laughs> the, to be you anyway. That is really insightful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure the the guys are watching that thing. Wow, it's pretty cool to to see that. Mm-hmm. I think it's pretty cool as a political geek. I think from the armed forces perspective, we have a great bunch of people values skills and i think raise, part of our mission at campaign force is really to help raise that bar particularly at local government yeah. with the twenty thousand yeah. councillors across the uk but one thing i'd really like to pick your brains upon as well sharon if i may is why aren't there enough, enough women stepping forward into politics wherever you look from local government to parliament we fall short and again it's kind of not a party political point but more generic point about politics why is this and what can we do to encourage more veteran um, women to stand up and serve again? Because I know that in my military career, I've been bowled over by the quality of women leaders and role models in, at various stages of my career. Exceptional people. Um, uh-huh. why, aren't, why aren't women stepping forward into politics as someone yourself that's successfully well, done so? Yeah, Um that that is the question and um labor as you know brought in um all women shortlists in 97 well pre-97 in order to sort of rectify the um the the woeful sort of disparity between the number of um the gender balance of mps and also then across the country um with regard to local government they also did a similar thing although the work what they would do if they're normally in a ward, a, a local government ward, there'll be three councillors. So if that was three men, the next time one of those positions was available, Labour would say it had to be a woman and would, oh, I've just got a vote, right? So it's just it's just popped up now, cast vote, I don't know if you can see. very so, exciting. And a yeah. web campaign force first, I have to right. say. Um, Wait there. So. I've got it. I better check the whip also to make sure I vote the right way. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I this should have been paying more I'm attention sure the, to this. I'm sure the gang don't mind uh, <laughs> if you go through. Sorry. Uh, right. So it's a division on the agriculture bill report stage new clause two, and I've got until seventeen forty seven to cast my vote. You'll probably then get a, you'll probably get a WhatsApp from a member of the family as well while you're doing it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I've just went onto the WhatsApp of my whip. There you go. Uh, right. I've got a vote. I on this one. Okay. New clause six. New clause two parish or new clause six if not pushed I. New clause seven I. Amendment because obviously I'm not in I'm not watching the proceedings because I'm doing this Zoom call. Amendment thirty nine abstain and three R no. Right. So I think if if it's new clause two or new clause six, I'm voting I. So I'll go back into the it's all very different because normally we'd have the. Um, I'd say this is amazing as a uh, a political geek. I hope I haven't see this right. Cast for cast for. Come on, let me do it. <laughs> cast for. This is brilliant. Right, so this is new clause two. Right, so I've got to vote I. So there's an I and a no. Oh, is that okay. not? Are there? Is that? Can yeah. you see? Oh yeah, see it. Yeah. 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 Got it. Um, yeah. Okay. That's I'm pretty, gonna, pretty clear. So I'm going to vote. I hit next. You're about to vote I in this division. Once you submit your vote, you will be unable to change it. <laughs> submit vote. Um, your vote of I was successfully submitted. Da, 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 for the yeah, the finishing clause. There we go. So I've just had wow. a little message saying I've voted I. So as long as I've voted the right way, I won't be in trouble with my whip. So Amazing. <laughs> There we go. Oh, so I might have a few more of those to do, but hopefully now I know what I'm doing. Well, no, um, just uh, we go. dream us. So, <laughs> so we were talking about local government. So where th- there would be three, 
um, we would sort of say one of them had to be a, a woman. And then when there was one woman and two men, that would be sometimes where it would get tricky. And so then they would look at the balance of the number of women from a Labour point of view on that council. Yeah. So if that council was still woefully still unbalanced, then even if that ward had one woman, the next seat up, if it was available, we would say it had to be a woman as well. So interestingly, it ended up, um, I, I was selected in 2004, I think prior to the 2005 election okay. on an all-woman shortlist. The reason was my predecessor, Joyce Quinn, was a woman and she was the only woman out of 13, was 12 men and one woman in town wow. and we are. So wow. the whole of Tyne and Weir, the, so there was no way they were going to allow, because we would just go backwards all the time. Um, so I was selected, I knew it had to be a woman. I was from the area. By that point, I was working for Unison. I'd been involved in sort of um, behind the scenes politics with Labour and Unison for probably eight, nine years um, then at that stage. So I knew there was sort of nobody else, no other woman that, I thought would have as good a chance as me um, in the northeast in that area, but I knew there was loads of men who would have probably had a really good chance of getting it who'd been in mm -hmm. local um, politics. So anyway, I threw my hat, hat in the ring, and um, a lot of women from all over the country did as well. And I won the selection by just five votes, and the woman I beat just—it was such a hard fight. On the fourth, it's transferable votes, and it was the fourth round of voting. Um, when the votes had all transferred and sort of cascaded down, that I won by five votes. And she was a former leader of a London council. So she was very, very accomplished, you know, really professional, um, could have probably won anyway. And my USP was that I was actually from Gates, that I was from that seat. And I thought I would walk it. I was thinking, well, you know, of course they're going to pick me. You've got to have some sort of competence if you want to do this anyway. But I think, of course they're going to they're going to pick me. Of course they are. And I couldn't believe how close that she came. And it made me realise that this is part of the prejudice and part of the um, the yeah. reason why I think a lot of women don't get into it because if if they'd been she looked and sounded more like an um, uh, MP. She was posher. She was had had a higher profile prior job. She looked more like an MP. And I know when I would go around talking to the members, um, a couple of times I thought, oh, I'm stuffed. What I thought was my USP went against me when a couple of times somebody would say, oh, yeah, just like me. And I thought, yeah. oh, that's not, that's not in, I know what them, at first I thought that's really nice. They were saying I was just like them. But in their head, they were thinking, you're just like me. And I don't think I'm good enough to be an MP. I could never be an MP. So that means you could never be an MP. Where this posh woman from London, leader of a local authority, oh, she sounds like an MP. She looks like an MP, you know, because we're talking sort of 16 years ago. So I, I did look younger and everything. But um, so, you know, to them, they were probably thinking, oh, yeah, I was, I was late 30s still. But, you know, they would be still thinking, oh, but you're just, you know, canny last from Gateshead, you know, you're not an MP. Yeah. Whereas imagine if that had been me and a man or men, no matter what background, it wouldn't have even had to have been a professional man, you know, a white middle-aged, um, you know, middle-class sort of lawyer type man. It would have, could have just been any man. And in their head, when they were battling with that sort of, do you look, who looks more like the MP? The yeah. eyes would have automatically went to the man when it come to the hustings and who they were going to choose because he would look in their eyes more like an MP because in the Northeast at that time, the whole of the Northeast, there was five women. Out of all the MPs in the Northeast, 50 MPs, there was five women. In Tyne and Weir, there was one woman out of 13. So when you're up against that level of disparity, and I know Sarah will probably speak for the armed forces and I'm bring you know, the men. Definitely. Uh, it's that, you know, if, if people, when they think of a general or a, a whatever major or whatever in their head, it's always a man that pops in. That yeah. is really, that unconscious bias is really hard to overcome. So we went down the road of positive discrimination. No other party has chose to do that. And consequently, even though the, the Tories under the, um, oh, they had a massive campaign. I can't remember the name of it now, led by Bernard Jenkins' wife. Um, oh, women that, to Win. 
Women to Win, yeah, a massive push, to, which did bring loads of women in. It still didn't get them to the 50-50 way. And I think we are now, Jess, I think we're practically there. Um, now, for, if we're not, we're 40, late 40s um, in, our, in Parliament. Obviously, in local government, there was a job of work done, but I think Sunderland now um, is almost at parity. Um, and there's even... There's, yeah, and there's women in the cabinet as well. So, no, and there's we are some, going forward. Yeah. yeah, so we are slowly, but it's that unconscious bias. And also, yeah. then the expenses scandal happened and all the, um, the, uh, the latest one with regard to the sexual discrimination, there's been the, the various, you know, the Me Too stuff. Mm. And lots of stuff came out that, about that and all of the, um, the abuse on social media. That just a lot of women just look at that and think, no, I, you know, I mean, when the expenses scandal happened, it was just awful with regard to yet yeah, children in school and people saying things to them. Like if my kids went in with a new a new school bag, people were going, oh, did your mum get that on expenses? You know, and so that sort of that public life aspect of being, you know, a, a politician. Sometimes maybe men are more willing to sort of. To, to go for that thinking they can maybe keep their family out of it and women are maybe more sensitive to the impact it might have on their family or their private life so there's, a, there's so many reasons some i think from, from some of that as well sharon is that that kind of idea of self deselection as well before you overcome all of those barriers because of the perception about what you think an mp look like looks like mm. and i think from the armed forces community we do have that problem of, of self deselection, and uh, my good friend Andy White from Barclays is on the call. Um, I know he tackles this in, in the financial services sector in particular of, of trying to say to veterans to not self deselect yourself out of roles just because you're not an officer or this, that, and the other. Mm. And he campaigns really hard within his sector. No, that is that is such a, um, a consideration and something we need to to sort of address somehow and social media has a lot to blame for that and I've seen the difference from in the 15 years I've been um, you know elected in a representative where it, in the early days social media wasn't really the factor that it is now um, I I do do take part in Twitter and do my own tweets and you know we put um, press releases and stuff up on Twitter but I, I try not to engage in sort of any of that banter um, so I will engage with people in, in a small way but I'm, I'm more use it for sort of posting stuff on Facebook as well we just post I do not engage at all and I don't even look at Facebook because that's where it can get really really nasty obviously I say all my emails so I say those emails coming in and sometimes um, you know people you know it, it can be awful and so the I think all women um, you know in, in public life sort of have that to to deal with and um, you know I always think and you shouldn't think like this I always think oh I'm lucky really I haven't had to deal with it in any of the way that some have I'm thinking of women you know Diane Abbott because the element of racism she's had more um horrible um abuse on social media than all of the other women in parliament put together but then there's MPs former MPs like Luciana Berger um Anna um Subri massive abuse you know anyone any time a woman would take a stand be it sort of Luciana Berger against the anti-semitism and the treatment there or and a um, Subri with regard to Brexit, the minute you would, a woman seems to put the head above the precipice, it's like, you know, you're a target then for everyone to then, Jess Phillips as well, in the same way, you're then a target for this abuse that I don't think is then targeted at men in the same way. And it's often sexual violence seems to, you know, threats of rape. I don't think a man who spoke out against Brexit or against anti-Semitism or against Jeremy Corbyn got the same abuse in that way with sexual violence as a woman does. You know, they might say, oh, you're talking a load of rubbish, that, you know, and be and might use sort of um, abuse about their physicality or what they look like. That might be the same for a woman and a man, although it is really 
horrible um, how it's used against women, but the sexual violence is something different. So I, I can totally appreciate anyone looking in on all of that thinking, oh, no way. There's no way I would want to invite any of that into my life. Um, you know, so how I deal with it, I, I did sort of at one time think um, it didn't affect me and it was water off a duck's back. When I would read through, there was a, a, a time during one of the, um, the the leadership when we'd all, I was one of the MPs who resigned when Jeremy Corbyn, you know, when there was the, the coup, as it was referred to, and the abuse then. And I would read it and sort of think, oh, oh. And then I, this day, I sort of had, I was at a church service and broke, broke down crying. And then I thought, oh, wow, you know, maybe this stuff does get to you sort of in a subliminal level. And then I realised I was just not going to read it anymore, that, you know, you can choose to read that stuff or you can just ignore it. So um, I try not to, not to read it, but... Um, how so then we still we still do need women therefore to to sort of be bold and to sort of make that decision because if we just leave you know this um arena if we just decide oh i can't you know if all the women just leave this arena then you know we're gonna go back massively um with regard to to representation um and it's not right and it shouldn't be this way but it is and i think we've just got to be brave and bold and step up it's really, really kind of you to sh to share that insight, and it's something that no nobody should endure. But you know, it's been played out in public and all too publicly about the abuse that MPs get. And um, you know, it's really generous for you to share that. Uh, but you know, you're only human; it's bound to affect you. And but it's useful actually. Some of those coping strategies, some of the practical stuff that you've mentioned about with Facebook, for example, is something we can all take on board. Um, because it, it transcends politics, social media, in terms of those abuse um, things that you know nobody should have to put up with. Thanks to our guests and thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe now. Alternatively, you can support our mission by checking out in the show notes below where you can rate, donate or become our mate. Thank you.